Well, welcome back to another episode of the Buffalo Happy Hour. Mike, what's going on? Derek, you know where we are. Oh, yeah. At our favorite place, Addie's Liquor, again. Yes, and we have a new guest, so we're excited. So let's start with introductions. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Jim Labuda. And what do you do, Jim? I am a golf professional in the Western New York area. I'm also the head women's golf coach at Niagara University and the head men's golf coach at Madai College. This has been a beautiful year for golf in the Buffalo area. It's been a spectacular summer, yes. Have you been out a lot? No. No. I played... (laughs) I spend a lot of time on golf courses, but I don't actually play a lot of golf. I only played five times this year. When did you start golfing? Like, how old were you? God, I was probably 14 or 15. Actually, maybe maybe even 13 when I started. I I grew up in the town of Tonawanda, not far from Brighton Golf Course. And back before the paddock dome was built and the outdoor driving range was put out there, there used to be soccer fields where the driving range is now. And they actually had a practice green that was about maybe a hundred yards out and a little tee. So when I was younger, my brother and I would take some clubs, go over there and just start hitting balls for the practice green and, you know, basically get out of the house in the middle of summer and find something to do. So from that point on, I just kind of got hooked into the game for whatever reason. It just, it was addicting to me. It is very understated how addicting golf is. You can suck like we both do. We're not good at golf at all. But you hit that one shot down the middle of the fairway, and you're like, oh, yeah, I could. I, I think next year I might go on tour. It's like, the shot that keeps you coming back for sure, yes. without a doubt. Yes. So you were younger. You played golf. And obviously probably one of the most important parts of golf is that putting or that chipping green practice area. Yes. That's the part that people tend not to focus on. They just try to hit it as far into the road as possible over right. the net in the paddock golf dome and all that stuff. So when did that transition come where you're like, you know what, I really want to get into golf as a profession in the future? Well, it really honestly only happened maybe 10 years ago or so. Oh, okay. I Once I graduated from college, I went to Canisius College. I, I, I was a swimmer my whole life. So I spent a lot of time swimming. And then in college, I just got burned out. I did not want to swim anymore. I had no desire to go into a pool. So... I knew Canisius had a golf team, so I went out and I played college golf. And again, it was addicting because it's not only golf, but it's it's the competition. It's the there's a huge difference playing tournament golf as there is to just playing regular golf with your buddies. I mean, Absolutely. the pressure it's so much different. But after I graduated college, I spent you know a long time working, let's say, in the real world. But I always kept up the passion for golf, and really, the passion was in teaching and coaching. So. I obtained a certification to be basically a part-time golf instructor. I built a my own website. I built my student base. I would go to local driving ranges and just basically what they called walk the line. So I would walk the driving range and a Tuesday, Wednesday evening, offering tips, passing mm-hmm. out business cards, really just trying to develop my own business. I got to a point about 10 years ago where I had an opportunity to kind of transfer, transfer into that or start teaching a lot more. And as I spent more and more time teaching, I started thinking, you know what? I may be able to make a career of this. Mm-hmm. Working nine to five in the financial services industry, it just, again, you get tired out sitting at a desk or behind a desk all day long. So I finally had an opportunity to transition into golf full time. Mm-hmm. And I've never looked back. It's been the biggest, the best decision I've ever made. So going back a second, you said you just played college golf. Like, were you a walk-on? Yes. Oh, all right. (laughs) So were they – they were D1 then as well for golf, correct? Yes. Oh, sick. All right, so you just walked onto a D1 college team and just played, and just all of a sudden you were – like, can you at least elaborate? Because there's normal people like me that shoot like a 300 at a 72 course. (laughs) In college, let's just say the Division I college golf – Canisius College right now has a phenomenal team. Back when I was playing, back in the early 90s, let's just say the team wasn't as organized, wasn't as phenomenal. It was a lot of kids just walking on saying, hey, I I play golf, sure, let's go give this a try. We had a couple kids on the team that were really good. I was more the middle of the pack to end of the pack, but I got to play in tournaments because it was, You know, I'm getting calls from my coach the night before, hey, this guy just backed out or he's got a class, so we need five guys to play. Can you play tomorrow? Yeah, sure, I'll skip school and go play. Why not? (laughs) Right. So what was your handicap back then? 
Uh, it was probably about when I was playing college golf, mm-hmm. probably about a six or seven. <laughs> Can you explain to the people too what handicap is? Handicap is a basically it's about an average of what you shoot over par. Mm-hmm. So if it's par seventy two, six or seven handicap is going to be six or seven over par for an eighteen holes. My handicap's like sixty five. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yeah, <laughs> sounds like you need some golf lessons on. Absolutely, we'll, we'll talk offline. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so when you're taking your handicap into tournament golf, how, or how does your handicap get factored into your ending score? Because it's actually a subtraction of what you got, or you're giving strokes to some people, right? Or depending depending on the tournament that you play. Sometimes there's there's considered a gross and a net, but when you're playing like Division One college golf or a lot of these top amateur tournaments. Mm-hmm. There's no handicap. Sure. It's just your net. So if I went out there and shot 85 or 90, the handicap doesn't come off there. It's just, hey, I shot 85. Some other guy shot 68. Yeah. You know, so that's just the way it works. Interesting. So when you were doing that and when you were at a six handicap or whatever, how often were you practicing? Because that to me is my biggest issue is I will go out there and I'll shoot like a an 86 or something, but then I won't go practice. And I keep expecting myself to get better. This is becoming a therapy session. (laughs) I expect myself to get better and it goes nowhere. So how often do you need to practice to get to that level? You, it's not about the quantity of the practice. It's the quality. Okay. You can go to a driving range and I see it all the time. Now you go to the driving ranges and you see the same people. They're there three, four times a week, hitting a bucket of balls, not really having a clue what they're working on (laughs) and they can still go out and not break a hundred. You know, it's when when in order to improve your golf game, you got to work on the short game, the chipping, the putting, the shots from 100 yards in. Everybody wants to go to the driving range, like you mentioned earlier, hit the ball 300 yards. They can hit it. Some of them might hit it 300 yards, but if you're 40 yards over in the the other fairway, Mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to get to the green and you're not going to lower your score. You're better off hitting it down the center of the fairway, don't hit it as far, but spend time working on the 100 yards and in-game. Sure. So if you're looking to improve your score, which that's what I spent a lot of time on, was because of that chipping area around Brighton where I grew up. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of times I wasn't hitting shots more than 100 yards or 90 yards. Or my brother and I would say, okay, let's go behind this tree or let's shoot hit from over here. And you know, this is a 75-yard shot that we got to hit. So we would play closest to the pin contest mm-hmm. and do things like that. And that's really what kind of made my game improve the fastest. Sure. So speaking of that and kind of how you transition this into your career again, in 2007, you started your own business, Jim Labuda Golf, and there was a focus on the golf fitness and golf psychology. Yes. So can you elaborate a little bit on that and what fitness and psychology play, starting with fitness? Because I can go out there and play with my 86-year-old grandfather, and he kicks my ass every time, even though I'm probably in better physical fitness than he Mm -hmm. is but for some reason he still scores better than i do so how does that play in if fitness has become such a huge part of all aspects of golf from juniors to amateurs right up through the professional ranks now and really it started a lot with tiger woods i mean you see him in the gym working out lifting weights and you know brooks kepka doing bench presses and roy mcelroy doing 400 pound deadlifts i mean these guys have realized that in order to improving golf, they also have to take care of their bodies because they're hitting hundreds of balls a day, sometimes even a thousand. They're doing that five, six times a week along with the constant travel. So making sure your body is in the proper condition by being able to heal faster, you know, so it's not, it's not just about lifting weights to hit the ball farther. That's what these guys are posting on social media. That's what you see. Mm -hmm. Golf fitness is more about stretching, mobility, flexibility exercises so that you can get to the proper positions in the swing. Not everybody can get their hands as high in the backswing as Dustin Johnson can because they have limited shoulder mobility and limited thoracic spine mobility. But these guys are basically can walk around like Gumby and bend in all sorts of different positions because on top of hitting balls and playing, practicing for seven hours a day, they're spending an hour in the gym. And then outside of the gym, they're doing an hour, an hour and a half of yoga and stretching and, and, flexibility exercises. So when Tiger came on the scene years ago and he put on all that muscle and then, you know, Rory came on and put on all his muscle that really translated into golf fitness and people today seeing, okay, I've got to go put on all the muscle to be able to hit the ball farther. Mm -hmm. 
But again, it's not all about the muscle. A lot of it is the stretching, the flexibility, the mobility. And that's what I spend a lot of time on with people today. Sure, we can go and do bench presses and you know we can give you workouts to do, but for the most part, it's more about the stretching, being able to recover faster from a round of golf so that by the time you get to the 14th, 15th hole, people are usually exhausted. Right. You know, you can't finish the round. Now your body is going to be able to finish the round in the same condition that you started it in. Sure. So when you talk about golf fitness and people lifting weights, the epitome of that right now is Bryson DeChambeau. He put on like 40 pounds over the course of quarantine and now he's bombing at 400 yards. Yes. So is there a limit to how much you can lift? Because eventually you're going to lose that flexibility, right? You know what? I don't know. I mean, I thought that with Tiger, when he went through a lot of his issues, he bulked up too much. And they talk about Rory bulking up too much. Now you see what Bryson has done, but he's also incorporated the stretching and flexibility Mm -hmm. into it. So as long as he's able to put on all that muscle, but still remain or still keep the elasticity in his muscles, hey, man, I hope he hits it 400 yards. Good for him. Right. It's changing the game. It is. For sure. It's it's all based on... To answer your question, because that's my background, like that's where I come from. It's be a meathead, go to the gym. But it got to a point where, to your, to the point you made about recovery and being able to do it day in and day out when you hit a hundred to a thousand balls five days a week. If you don't stretch before your workout, there's there's obviously a ton of theories, and I'm sure we're gonna get flack other than loved it in the comments. But <laughs> the the people come back and say if you stretch before your workout. It's it does A, B, and C. And then there's other people like say if you don't stretch before but you only stretch after, you get A, B, and C. So there's all different kinds of, yeah. of theories. But from personal experience, when I worked out and I was my body was just getting destroyed, if I didn't spend minimum 20 minutes work or stretching before I actually picked up a weight to do my warm-ups before I then did my workout, mm-hmm. I was just there was no way. Like I you could physically feel yourself getting hurt. Like yeah. my back would you just get to tweak in your back and you're like, this is insane. And then you asked to play golf with me and like the second hole in, it was the same thing. Like lower right, my lower right side of my back was getting super tight. And I'm like, I don't know what it is. Like maybe I'm just emphasizing something too much. And then I just totally relaxed, swung through, didn't think about it. And then the ball went 30 yards further straighter and I didn't put as much power in. And I'm like, I don't get this. I don't understand this game at all. And you're like, it's all technique. So kind of going to that, when you're, when someone's watching golf and they're watching these pro players hit and they're trying to emulate their swing, there's a physical limitation that they can't do that. So would you recommend going to a Jim Labuda golf to get an understanding of how their body should swing the club or is it, should we, we should all strive to hit it like this? No, absolutely. So, and you know, one of the big things now is we do fitness screenings with almost every. St- I do fitness screenings with almost every student that I have, because you have to be aware of their physical limitations. If somebody's got a bad back or a bad hip or a bad shoulder, that's going to affect how they swing a golf club. They may not be able to go into the positions I need them to go into, or it may be too painful for them to make a full backswing or do whatever in the swing based on their physical limitations. So, no, we need to definitely physical make sure people are being physically screened before you start doing these kind of movements with your body i mean let's face it the golf swing is weird Mm -hmm. it's not natural so if you feel something you feel like you're doing something wrong in the golf swing it's probably right but again it's one of those things that you have to be able to make sure your body can get into those correct positions or get in those awkward positions before you go out there and hurt yourself so do you also ask have you played any other sport before? Because there's always the common misconception, or I don't even know if it's a misconception, but everyone's like, well, I played baseball, so my golf swing is going to be all over the place because I played baseball. And or, hockey players are hockey. just good. Yes. Right. So do you also ask that question and then gear kind of that conversation? It, it, I do. And a lot of the, I don't even call them errors, but a lot of the deficiencies or the mistakes I see in people's swings are related back to the sports that they played. Mm-hmm. If you swing a baseball bat, you step forward, but a lot of your weight is still on your back foot when you hit the ball. In the golf swing, it's the opposite. Your weight's on your front foot. So you want to be able to shift your weight in the back swing to your back foot, and then as you come down at impact, you want the majority of the weight on your lead foot. Totally opposite from the baseball swing. But for people who played baseball, they sit back on their on their trail side, and that usually causes a slice for them to hit the ball for a right-hander to the right side. <laughs> See? There you go. Yeah. Wow, that that's insane. So going to the the psychology aspect of it, what 
role does the mental game play in golf? That's a loaded question. Yeah, I yeah. Know. it how is. Do you, how do you stay calm? <laughs> If I could asking answer that question, I mean, <laughs> yeah, ask it for a friend. <laughs> it's one of the things that I strive to that everybody teaches these days is a pre shot routine. That's how all these professionals can go up there and, right. you know, hit a drive in the 18th hole of the Masters when they have a one shot lead and look like they do it every day. I mean, the guys really, their hearts are pounding, especially if you're going in there for the first time or, you know, you're not a Tiger Woods or a Jack Nicholas and you've been in that position before. But having a consistent pre-shot routine allows you to repeat the same motions over and over. So when you're coming down the stretch and you've got a tee shot on the 18th hole, or even if it's an iron shot into an 18th green mm-hmm. to beat your buddy for who's buying the round of beers, you know, by going and having that consistent pre-shot routine, that establishes a repetitive action in your mind. On top of that, one of the things that I've been teaching a lot, and I teach this to a lot of my college players, is you've got to have a post-shot routine. So your reaction to the shot has to be the same every single time. You can't get too high, you can't get too low, because that's going to affect the shots going forward. So let's say for a post-shot routine, you finish your swing, you follow through, you watch the ball, great, your shot ended up five feet from the hole. You have really no reaction, people say, nice shot, thank you, you move on. You go to the next hole, you flub your shot, you shank an iron shot. You've got to kind of have the same reaction of, okay, one of the most important things I was taught is that the most important shot in golf is the next shot. Mm -hmm. You can't change what happened in the past. And that's, again, huge issue with these college players is that they focus on something three holes ago. I can't believe I missed that putt or I hit that iron off the green three holes ago. Well, it doesn't matter. You can't fix that. You've got to move forward right. and focus on the next shot that you can control and the next thing that you can ha- make happen in a positive way. Mm-hmm. So that pre, pre-shot pre and post-shot routine, should that be developed on the driving range? And what does the driving range, what should you be doing, I guess, from like a mental standpoint on the driving range to prepare you for that outing? The pre-shot routine is is huge on the driving range. And I work with a lot of people over the winter months in developing solid pre-shots routines. Because again, you go to a driving range, you buy a large bucket of balls, you're through it in what? 45 minutes, mm-hmm. an hour maybe, tops? Maybe. You're, hitting, <laughs> you're hitting ball after ball after ball, mm-hmm. not really aiming. But yet when you go out on the golf course, it's different because there's targets. You have a green to aim at. You might have a bunker on the left you don't want to hit towards. You guys have been to the driving range, right? Mm-hmm. You know they put those flags out there for a reason. Yeah, That's the whole thing. Every time you put a ball down on the mat, you should go stand behind the ball, set up, aim, and make sure you're doing that on every single shot on the driving range so that when you go onto the golf course, that transitions into your routine on the golf course. The more you do it on the driving range, the more you practice there and get used to it, the easier it's going to become for you to do it on the golf course. Same thing with the post shot. It's not when you're practicing on the driving range, I'd establish a pre shot routine there more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can still work on the post shot routine. And if you miss hit a shot, kind of interpret it. And what did I do wrong in that swing? But then moving to the post shot, that's more important. We work on that more on the golf course. Sure. Driving range is definitely more of a pre shot routine. So, what encompasses a post? Is it just reaction on the post shot? It's mainly reaction. And really what's going through your mind, teaching people that if you miss hit a shot, you may have a reaction, but in your mind, you can't go, God, I suck, you know, because it's got to be, okay, miss hit that one. You've got to maintain that positive attitude from shot to shot, realizing it again, you miss hit that shot. I can't control the outcome. So it is what it is. I got to move on to the next shot. That's the point that we make when we golf together and then we'll hold our backswing and then look at the ball just going, we lost the ball, and we're just still standing there, and we're just smiling, we're like, nailed it. And then we just laugh, and we're like, what are we going to do? Like, yeah. it's, But okay, so right. that, that if you would could, be a, even if it's good, we would probably still have that same reaction. Yeah. Right. But it just feels weird holding a pose, knowing that you hit that tree right to your right. <laughs> and you're just like, oh, yeah, nailed it. We're good. Yeah, I do it because I lost my ball. I'm like, where did that even go? And you're like, it hit the tree three feet in front of you and then <laughs> shot way over there. It's like, oh, sick. So that one's gone. You're like, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. the water. All right. <laughs> but as long as you're not getting mad at each other, throwing right. your clubs or breaking them over your knee, 
you're good. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So you also won in 2018 and 2019 one of the top 100 instructors by World Golf Teachers Association. And then also in Lessons.com, you were named the best instructor in 2018. So what was that process like? And were, were you like nominated for it? Did you apply for it? How does that happen? Lessons.com is just something that it's a lot of students will people go online and they'll start searching, you know, where can I get golf lessons? So it's just, again, it's a way for the internet and social media these days to kind of find me as a golf instructor Mm -hmm. for people out there who don't know. The World Golf Teachers Federation is a subsidiary. Actually, it's, it's the parent organization of the United States Golf Teachers Federation, where I got my teaching certification. Oh, okay. So there's the United States, there's the Canadian, there's the Chinese, there's a New Zealand organization, I think, there's an England. So anybody that's a member of any of these organizations can be nominated and then chosen as a top 100 instructor. So I had to apply to be um, nominated. I had to apply for it to see if I could go on there and be named to the list. And then I had to have some students that wrote up you know, just little summaries of me and how I work with them and things like that. And I was honored enough to be named one of the top 100 instructors. That's crazy. What an accomplishment. It is. Thank you. So it's worldwide. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, and we're talking to them. Yeah. (laughs) That's insane. That's awesome. And you're local. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of why you could golf anywhere. As of right now, I would love to. My family right now is, we're based in New York. You know, I've got a teenage daughter who i just not going to pull out of high school right now. But, you know, a couple years, you never know what's going to happen. It's, right. I do. It's called Arizona. Yeah. Where there's Florida. more courses. Yeah. I, right. Name it. Arizona, Florida, Carolinas. Utah. There's a ton of gorgeous courses. South in Carolina. Just play yeah. Hilton Head all the time. Yeah. Awesome. It's nice. So speaking of your past experiences too, you were an assistant golf coach at Buffalo Tournament Club in 2017, and then you were also at Terry Hills, correct? Yes. And then you're the director of golf operations and assistant GM at Harvest Hill. I was. So how did you – how do you do that for three courses? <laughs> like what was the – did you go to one and then jump to another? No, they were all separate. Because I mean, I, I so many love questions. Harvest Hill so much. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I was I was a full time employee at Harvest Hill for a while, and then I left there, went to focus at Terry Hills. But again, you know, being from Buffalo area, Terry Hills is out in Batavia, so mm-hmm. driving to and from work five six days a week, 45, 50 minutes out there, put a lot of miles on the car, and you know, took a lot of time away. So started looking for a couple other assistant jobs or you know teaching jobs locally here. Ended up at Buffalo Tournament Club for a couple of years and. This past summer was my first season out at Lancaster Country Club. Oh, cool. So that's how, awesome. How is that? Amazing. It's it's an amazing place. The the membership is fantastic. It's my first time working at a private facility, but all the employees from the general manager down to the head pro, the other assistant I work with, even to like the kitchen staff and the ground staff, I mean, everybody is such a team over there. It's just that's it's great. amazing. It's a I love working there. It's so sweet. Yeah. I would love to play that course. That course just seems great. So speaking of public courses, and not to say which one you hate the most, but which one or which ones do you like the most or prefer to play the most? Bobolinks. (laughs) That's where I got my teaching started. So it's it's always a fun course to go out there and play. But honestly, one of my favorite courses to go out and play is Holiday Valley down in Ellicottville. Okay. It's so much fun because your front nine is kind of flat. But it's so different when you get on the back nine because if you guys ski, Mm -hmm. you play on the ski slopes. So, you know, you might be going up one hill, you're going down another hill on another hole, and there's so many different interesting shots to play there. It's not something you really see in a lot of the local courses around here. You know, Buffalo, let's face it, there's some terrain, there's some up and downs on these courses, but... Nothing like you see if you go play Holiday Valley. Yeah. Have you ever played Holiday Valley? Uh, you are up on a no. platform. There's this one hole. I don't know. Is it 14 or 13 or something where the there's par- two fairways? It's a par five and you're yes. just launching it off the hill. It is the most fun to watch it shank into the woods. <laughs> but like if you hit a good shot and you just see that fly, it's such a good feeling. And then there's that par three. I can't remember which hole it is, but it's like 200 yards. But you hit like an eight directly. or a nine iron because yeah. it's directly downhill. <laughs> it's We got to play that. It's but when you're that. standing on the tee... And you look back and you see all the ski villas and all the chateaus back there. I mean, the view you get from there is amazing. It's awesome. 
Yeah. It's one of the best courses in the area. I, I like Harvest Hill. I had a membership there for a little bit. Um, and then it, it's just, if you find, if you're really taking golf seriously and you want to learn how to compress your shots, you got to go to a good course because if you go to like a place that's primarily gravel, you're going to mess up your wrists. Yes. So outside of those two courses, where else do you like? Really, I'll go play anywhere I can. I can. You know, I grew up playing Brighton and Sheridan, mm-hmm. and I'll still say that going to Sheridan is one of the best public courses in the area. You know, but again, because it's a town municipal course, it's hard to get on there now. It's very busy. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's so many good public courses in the area. You know, it's just just being able to get outside and golf. Holiday Valley is a great course. Um, I enjoy playing Glen Oak. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a lot of fun too. Glen yeah. Oak is a great course. So transitioning a little bit to your other job, which is college golf, mm-hmm. you are the women's golf coach at Niagara University and the men's golf coach at Madai. Yes. So what made you get into that type of teaching where you wanted to help college students rather than just help anybody coming off the street? I actually really kind of stumbled onto the Niagara job. And it happened because I was teaching an individual one day at the Paddock Golf Dome. And one of the workers there who I've known for many years came up to me and said, hey, the Niagara team is practicing downstairs. Their coach, I believe, might be leaving. Would you be interested in coaching a college team? And this guy was just a town employee. He had nothing to do with Niagara, but he knew that for whatever reason, the coach told him, I might be leaving. We're looking for a new coach. So I said, yeah, sure. Why not? Coaching college golf? Sure. No problem. I went downstairs from the at the dome, talked to the coach, gave him my business card. He's like, "Yeah, okay, we'll be in touch." It took like three or four days. Assistant athletic director called me, set up an interview, went out to Niagara. About a week later, I was named coach. So, wow! Yeah, that is quick. <laughs> it is. Well, it was quick because this all happened like February and March when they were still practicing, and I think I was named coach. If I want, if I remember correctly, it was like March eighth or ninth or something. Their conference championships were like the second week in April. So I had like four weeks to work with the team before we went and played for the conference championship. So, yeah, I kind of just stumbled across that. How'd they do? Honestly, they had their best finish ever tied for fifth out of nine teams. Wow. (laughs) What? (laughs) Okay. So we probably should have done this during the day out on a golf course somewhere. We right. could have gotten some working for you I guys know. here. I mean, that would have been great. That's, that's we will insane. definitely be in talks. <laughs> but so I'm assuming that the role of a golf coach at a college is significantly different than having your own private business. So what is how do you tailor your approach to the students? Is is it the same? No. No, okay. it's it's totally different because with a lot of the students, I mean, I'm also involved in not even involved, but I'm also informed about like how they're doing in their classes. Mm. So it's not so much about, yeah, it's the golf performance and we maximize the golf performance. But if you're struggling in a class, you know, I also need to talk to you about, Hey, what's going on in this class? Why are you missing these assignments? You know, this professor is saying that you're failing this class. We need to put more time in here. Gotcha. So it's that area has taken me some getting used to, but also I start to realize too, that a lot of these parents that send their kids to college and especially to play golf, the parents are also kind of putting their faith and trust in me as a coach to say, hey, you know, my daughter, my son is going to be in your hands now, not only for golf, but, you know, as you can help guide them along in their college career. You know, if they're struggling in a class, they're going to come to me first as a coach or the school will, as opposed to going to the parents. You know, these kids are 18 years old. They're adults now. So So when it comes to the practice portion of specifically collegiate golf is it focused more on driving range or is it more course management actually out on the course it's it's actually a combination of both and it changes throughout the season sure so basically we'll spend the first couple days at school once we're able to start practice for both teams we'll spend the first couple days playing on the course a lot of times it's just getting people back acclimated to our home courses Um, A lot of times it's just I've got new freshmen coming in that I might have seen play once or twice or watch videos of their swing. So it's learning more about their games. Then from there, we always go and figure out, like at the first tournament, what they struggled with. So I might say for some of my Niagara girls, I've got a team right now, I believe, of eight. So I might have, after our first tournament, I might have, okay, you three, your putting was horrible. We're going to the putting green. You two need to go out and play. 
you need work on your bunker shots. So you go over to the practice bunker and I'll see you two on the driving range. So for me, it's a little bit more of determining what each person needs help with because not everyone's going to struggle with the same thing. Sure. You know, so, and then once this person's putting improves, they may putt great the next tournament, but then their iron play might have been faulty. So then it's, okay, you're on the driving range with your iron work. Let's go over here. So it's me really kind of determining what each one of them needs to focus on in order to improve. How many total kids are on the team? I've got eight girls at Niagara and right now six guys at Madai. I feel like being a golf coach has to be so difficult because if you're talking about like a football coach or any other sport, you have a confined field. Golf courses are massive. So do you have help? Like, How can you be everywhere at once? You can't. <laughs> it, it's hard. And that's that's one of the struggles I went through my first tournament because when we go play practice rounds for our tournaments, we'll establish – okay, this green is tough to read, this par three, it's tough to pick a club, not really sure what club to hit off this tee. Mm -hmm. So the way it's separated is like, I'll take five people to a tournament, top four scores count. So because not all five are playing together, I'll have one person in one group with two or three other kids from other schools. So they're usually doing 10 minute tee times, which allows someone to play a whole hole. So that means by the time my f last person tees off a one, the first person that teed off is probably on the fifth tee. So the nice thing is that during all these college tournaments, the kids have to walk. Mm -hmm. Good for them, bad for me. <laughs> but I get a cart. So I'm driving oh. from the fifth hole. Once my last person tees off, I'll shoot out to the first person at the fifth hole. Hopefully two, three, and four weren't holes they needed me on or were greens that were tough to read. Because if they were, they just – have to go through it themselves. Okay, so you're the, basically their caddy. College students don't have their own caddy. Do no, that sounds like a dumb question, but no, they carry their own clubs or they use push cards. But yeah, as a coach, I'm allowed to go up and give them advice so they can ask me questions and what do you think about this? I want to hit this club here. So yes, basically, I'm basically a caddy for the team at the time. That's a lot. That's a lot. So yeah. do you go out and scope the courses ahead of time before? Like, how often do, are they playing a course that they don't know? Most of the time. Really? It, it's tough because a lot of the courses, like it, being a coach of Niagara, which is a Division One program, their tournaments are usually multiple days. So they'll play, let's say, we'll have a practice round on a Saturday or Sunday, and then we'll actually play the tournament the next two days. So if practice around on a Saturday, we'll play 30, 18 Sunday, 18 Monday. Madai, being a Division Three, they're more of one-day events. Mm. So those kids don't get practice rounds unless we're at our conference championship. So those kids are more – I'm doing more scouting online to see what the courses kind of look like so we can talk about it in the van ride up, get to the course, they get out there and say, okay, this is the hole we talked about. Let's take a look at it. How are you hitting the ball today? Do you think you can clear that tree? Do you think you can go for the water? Should you lay up? Things like that. It's a lot easier having a practice round, whereas a team, you can go out and hit different shots into sure. the holes and putt on different spots of the green. So it's the two teams and then being in two different divisions definitely has their challenges mm -hmm. to them. Wow. How do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> That's, man, it's tough. You know, there's a lot going through your mind, you know, especially with in the middle of the season. My A lot of the Niagara tournaments are on the weekends. The Madai tournaments are during the week. So usually I'm working at the golf course during the day. If there's no tournament that day, then it's off to practices for either one or both teams. Sometimes I'm going from the golf course to Fox Valley, which is Madai's home course, watching the guys play at Fox Valley. Then I'm driving out to Niagara Falls Country Club for Niagara's practice, hanging out with the girls out there, then coming home. So I'll leave home. 6, 6.30 in the morning sometimes, get home 7, 7.30 at night. Say hey to the family, have some dinner. How was your day? Good, I'm going to bed. I get to do it again tomorrow if I'm not traveling to a tournament the next day. Wow. Remember when you worked at Batavia and you said there's a lot of miles on your car? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah. So, so talking about just the achievements of both clubs, because you've been, you've been part of these clubs, what have they achieved from like a standing standpoint or any tournaments that they've done? Niagara's had a, some good achievements. We actually had 
the best finish ever in the conference championship four weeks after I took over as coach, which was good. They tied for fifth in the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference out of nine teams. Um, nice thing is, too, I didn't mention this, but our conference championships are held at Disney. Ooh. So we fly down to Orlando, Look get put that. up in a hotel down there for a few days, play the Disney courses. So that's a nice perk, too. Um, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> last year, we had um, one of my seniors on the team last year, Sarah Godfrey. She was the first Niagara player to win an individual title at a tournament. So she won a title in Staten Island that was a tournament put on by Wagner University. And she beat actually another Niagara girl who was a sophomore, Susan Leone, and a freshman from Monmouth University. They were all tied after 36 holes, so they had to go into a playoff on the 18th hole. She parred the par five where the other two made bogey, and she was the winner. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. That I, I just love golf so much. It is, and it, for me, it's it's the competitive aspect of mm -hmm. it. I mean, I'm not hitting the putts. I'm not hitting the shots. But watching that playoff last year, realizing that I had two players with a chance to make Niagara history, and all they had to do just beat this girl from Monmouth, who's a right. freshman, it's like, come on, one of you has to do it, so <laughs> let's do it here. Yeah, so, remember that pre-shot routine. Exactly. So for D1 schools, are you doing scouting or anything like that? Uh, how, how does that process work with trying to get kids that are from high school that are good and you just want to bring them to Niagara? It's tons of recruiting. That's yeah. what I do. Yeah, it's it's, And that's really probably the biggest part of the job. Sure, there's all the travel plans. There's you know organizing these tournaments and the practices, but – You've got to be able to find the kids that, number one, are good enough to play Division One college golf, that want to come out and play, but yet that also excel in the classroom because they also have to have the time management aspect. You know, there's plenty of good golfers out there, but if they can't balance their time so that they know sometimes on the weekends, look, it's not about going out this weekend. I've got homework I catch up on. I had practices and two tournaments this week. You know, it's making those decisions. So you've got to find not only kids that are good at school, kids that want to continue their golf career, but also mature enough individuals that know, hey, you know what, I've got to work more on time management here too. And chances that any of these kids, either at Madai or Niagara, let's face it, are they really making the PGA or LPGA tour? I hope so. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. But ultimately, that four-year degree that you're going to get is going to be your future. Sure. So we need to focus more on that. We make sure the kids are studying. And, you know, again, recruiting is a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. there a handicap requirement to join D1 schools? No. No? Okay. No. So it's just you, you, the style you play? Like, how does that – how would you judge if someone's good enough to play for D1 school? I look at a lot of their scores. Okay. You know, so it's not – a lot of kids will send me emails or I'll get videos of their swings and – a lot of high school matches are all nine hole matches. So that doesn't really tell me much. Yeah, if your kid's shooting 36, 37 for nine holes, okay, they're good. But let me look at some of your 18 hole scores. So over the summer, like the local PGAs have the PGA Junior Tours, those are all 18 hole events. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of places that run Junior Tours also, like up in Canada, they've got a, it's called the Maple Leaf Junior Tour. So it's a lot of Canadian kids that go out. And they play 18 or 36 whole events. The Hurricane Tour is another tour that's around. They don't really have too many tournaments around here, but Rochester, Syracuse, Pennsylvania, Ohio. So if I got if I see kids that are playing in those events that are putting up good scores, those are the kids you want to look at because they're able to play competitive golf. Sure. A lot of your high school golfers, they're multi-sport athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, they're playing golf, basketball, soccer, something in the spring, right. whatever. So if you've got kids that are playing these other events, they're focusing a lot more on golf. Sure, they may play other sports, mm -hmm. but for me, that tells me that they really enjoy the tournament aspect of golf because they're playing 18 whole events, they're playing 36 whole events, they're traveling to other states or other cities to go play these events instead of just playing what's local. Right. Has there been any alum that have gone extremely far um, with golf? Not from either program, no. Okay. Not, not yet. Mm -hmm. Give me a couple of years and – We'll get a couple out there. That's so exciting. It I is. Like that. <laughs> it is. So how can somebody get in touch with you if they wanted some lessons from you personally? They could go to my website. I've got a website. It's uh, jimlabudagolf.com. 
they can go there, fill out a contact form. People can, you know, feel free to send me a message there. They can email me. My email address is Buddha, B-U-D-A underscore golf at yahoo.com. So either way. Nice. Do you have an Instagram or any type of social media that you want to plug? Yep. I'm on Facebook, Jim Labuda Golf. Instagram, Jim Labuda Golf. Nice. Twitter, I believe, is just Buddha Golf. But if not, it's under Jim Labuda Golf. So those are the three I'm on. All right. Outstanding. And then what are your typical hours for your your personal business? Is it just whenever you can fit it in or... I, I mean, yeah. you, you're pretty much up like 23 hours a day anyways. <laughs> pretty much. I mean, as of right now, I'm kind of limited to what the domes are open at, yeah. Yeah. you know, so it's nine ten in the morning till seven, eight at night, you know, weekends too. I'm always there, you know, during the summer though. Yeah. Lessons at six thirty, seven, seven thirty in the morning, whenever people are available, you start going basically right up until dark. What's the best tea time? Are you a morning tea time or are you an afternoon guy? I want to be the first one off. Yeah. Well, when your handicap's six, <laughs> yeah. I went too. <laughs> yeah. It, you get off, first one off, you get, the, you get the whole day ahead of you, you get the 18 holes in quick. Plus, mm-hmm. there's no one in front of you slowing you down. Mm-hmm. You know, you could fly through the course that way. So, yeah. Have you done any tournaments yourself recently? No. No? No. Would you I, like to? I have a lot of work on my game to do mm-hmm. before I can even consider playing tournament golf. Sure, down the road, maybe it'd be fun, but... You know, coaching two college teams with all the lessons, plus working full time, plus doing all that and trying to maintain some semblance of a home life with my wife and daughter right. and, you know, making sure they're all good and we're bonding as a family. That's more important to me than getting out and playing tournament golf, maybe down the road. We'll see what happens here. So how impactful are the clubs that you choose to play with? Because I remember when I was like it was just like two years ago that I just upgraded my clubs. I had this 2001 set of TaylorMades that were not very good. And for some reason I thought that upgrading my clubs would make me better and it didn't. So uh, how does, uh, how do clubs help the person or do they not? No, they, they definitely do. I mean, there's so many different aspects of a club these days and there's so much technology that's been put into them based on, you know, when I started in the golf industry years ago, working at a retail store, it was the big thing was the Callaway Big Bertha. Mm-hmm. You know, the head of the club was huge because it was the oversized drivers that were first starting to come out. Now you look at that Callaway Big Bertha and it's probably like a three wood or five wood today, <laughs> Yeah, you know, but the technology that's been put into these clubs these days with the, the, the different metals and the heads and the adjustable heads and you know, people going out and getting custom fit with a shaft that works for you and, you know, making sure it's the right flex and it's the right flex point and the lie angle's correct. I mean, all that is so important to playing really your best golf. Mm-hmm. So it's something you got to do. Would you ever fit people for clubs? Do you do that now? I do. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. I do. All, on top of all these things during the summer, I do also do some uh, fitting work for TaylorMade. <laughs> So I work oh, with TaylorMade as a demo tech and I do some of their fittings out there. So we'll go to different courses and, you know, a couple times a week and do some fittings and get people interested in the product. Yeah, me too. I am. Yeah. TaylorMade is my go-to right now. Same I have, here. I have a set of TaylorMade P760s, I think. Yep. And I, I love them. Tremendous club. Yeah. yeah. TaylorMade is top notch in the industry right now. What do you I'm got, just Mark? here. You guys, you guys are just living your best <laughs> he, life. He just started last year, was it? Or this year? Barely. Yeah. yeah. This is my first actual, like... I golf now yeah. and it's, it's a, it's a transition, but yeah. I'm getting through it. And it's addicting. You want to keep going. It's bad. Yeah. Because there's, I mean, he's seen like, there's, there's some couple good drives and I played at Delaware, Delaware with my brother-in-law and I ended up driving a couple greens for the first time in my life. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, that's that. Okay. So I'm doing something right. But then I realized if I recorded myself, my form is just atrocious, <laughs> but the ball's going straight and far. So whatever. Well, those are the shots that keep you coming back. And that's, you know, yeah. And, and then it's just fun to get outside, like you said. Right. And to just get away from everything. There's right. no noise. It's just you clubbing everything and bringing up all the grass behind the ball. It's perfect. It's yeah. a super good time. In fact, there might be a cold, frothy beverage. You know, it doesn't always hurt, too. Right. Oh, helps. too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Or if you're us, it's cold because we're trying to play during a frost delay. Yeah. But well, that's fine. That could be it, too. <laughs> we just went out to, where did we go? It was Eden, Eden Valley. Yeah. And it was 32 degrees when we teed off. You can't swing a club very well when you're frozen. <laughs> How many layers of clothes do you have to have we on? I mean, it's it's so hard. We had one layer. Oh, God. And then yeah. they, they delayed it for like 45 minutes. They're so like, you can't tee off. Or like, why? It's just water. <laughs> like, no, like the ground's frozen. <laughs> yeah. But like, that's actually an interesting point because if you have a form 
that your swing normally is, you can't be that flexible when it's that cold out. No. So if you try to make that same exact swing, I learned that the hard way. If you try to make that same exact swing, it's not working. Right. Not at all. That and the amount of clothes you wear restricts everything. Yeah. Right. Like you got to be loose. And that's where too a lot of the the fitness well, comes in because <laughs> you need to have a stretching routine. You know, too many people again they get out of the car, they go right to the first tee to play. They're not really swinging at the club at all. They might take a few big cuts with the driver, but you're doing more damage to your body than you are. Kind of like you talked about earlier with you My know back. your back and loosening up before you even work out. It's the same thing. You've got to be able to stretch those muscles out, loosen up. And if it's cold out, yeah, that's that stretching routine, that warming up before you go play, that's got to be a longer period of time. Yeah. Unfortunately for me, I just take out the driver and I say, all right, let's just send it so I don't do <laughs> stretching. <laughs> but that's something I do have to get better at. And like right. we talked yeah. about earlier, it's the, it's the driving range, it's the repetition, it's making every shot on the driving range count. Right. Because the biggest thing, even with you, is like, well, how come it's so easy to do this on the driving range? It's because you don't care. Right. And you're just hitting it out there to nothing. And if you actually made each single shot count, you're going to notice this is what you need improvements on. When I'm teaching, we go, when especially you see it a lot in outdoor driving range. People go up, you'll start, they'll start hitting balls. About 10 to 15 shots in, you're walking them through their swing. Okay, how was that shot? How was this? Then I ask them, where are you aiming? What target are you aiming for? 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is, I don't know, out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you can't just aim out there on the driving range because when you go onto the golf course, you're either aiming at a fairway or you're aiming at a green or on a par three, you might be aiming at a flag. So if you're not doing it on the range, you can't take that same swing onto the golf course. You're basically just wasting your time on the range, hitting balls, just doing it aimlessly. You're not going to improve at all. You need to have a target. You've got to go through the pre-shot routine, continue to aim. Then you can take that out to the course. It's very similar to being a quarterback. Because you can't just throw into an empty parking lot. Like you have to have some sort of target to actually dial in your accuracy. Correct. That it's golf is the strangest game because you like you practice your golf swing. It's like what does that even mean? Like well, you have to you have to hit like 100 balls a day. You're like to what? And right. like it's not it's not just the ball's trajectory. It's literally the motion of your body doing all the things. Like your putting has to like practice a two foot putt and do that the same spot the same, and we've done that before where you're just like try it again try it again luckily no one was behind us and then the people in front of us were uber slow <laughs> so i'm just and then by like the ninth rep it went in flawlessly yeah. and i was like oh that's that's golf practice like right. i'm not used to that like i'm used to tackle drills or like speed ladder drills or something like go work out like and here's your full program like it's all designed right. but for golf it's it's a whole different universe. So it, that being said, would you recommend hitting off of a mat into a net in your garage? Because at that point, you're not aiming for anything. Right. I mean, I've got a lot of students that do that. The issue with that is that are you just reinforcing bad habits? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're working on something specifically and you can tell by the way the club contacts the ball, whether you hit it good or whether you hit it fat or whether you hit it thin, that's fine. One of the things I've gotten into recently is doing online lessons, and especially over the past year with everything that's been going on. I've got students that right now that are doing online lessons with me that are based in California, Michigan, Florida, and all they do is they use an app on their phone called Coach Now that they basically can record their swing, post it in the app. I get a notification that they post it. I can go in, review their swing, send some information, send some drills back to them so they can work on their swing at home. Mm -hmm. So if people are doing that at their in their garage, one of the things I do with all my lessons is that I give them access to this Coach Now app because it's it's so important that when you're practicing, whether it's at the dome when I'm not there or whether it's in your garage or even during the summer when you're at the driving range, if you're working on something with your swing, we gotta make sure we stay in contact and make sure you're working on the right things. So I encourage people to take videos of their swing post them so you can watch what's going on and you can look back at a previous swing and say, well, wait a minute, that's not what I was doing when I hit the ball well. My club was coming more inside, the top of the swing looked different, so they can go back to those feelings. So sure, hitting balls in your garage, you'll keep the flexibility, you'll keep the mobility, things like that, but if you're making actual swing changes, you've got to have this video analysis that I offer to go with it. What's crazy about golf is – you don't feel like you're doing what you should be. So like if you told me, Derek, take your swing halfway back, 
there's no way that I'm going to even make it remotely close to halfway back because right. what I'm feeling is completely different than what I'm doing. So that's why you should be recording yourself because that way you will know, oh, this is actually halfway back. My 50-yard shot with a 56-degree wedge is this position, and this is what I should be feeling. Yes. It's so important. And again, video analysis with technology these days, I mean, you look back at, you know, like when Jack Nicholas was playing, those guys didn't have video. <laughs> they didn't have fitness. They got done playing. They went inside to the bar. They drank till midnight. <laughs> they got up the next morning and played again. Yeah. You know, when they practiced, it was a bunch of practice. Same thing. I'm going to eat a steak for dinner. I'm going to the bar. Mm-hmm. Now these guys today, it's all about the fitness, the nutrition, that, you know, they got so much technology in their games. And that's why they're hitting the ball 60 yards further right. than anybody did back then. Yeah, the clubs help too, but there's just yeah, so much more. Yeah, they're not using wooden clubs anymore. <laughs> right, yeah, those old yeah. persimmon woods, they're not using those yeah. anymore. They now got they're them. doing twist face and everything Yep. to make it easier. Yeah. That's crazy. So what type of training aids would you recommend somebody get if they're just starting golf? Yeah, like that strike mat or whatever where the club comes across and then it literally forms itself right. to how the club hit it. I don't. Personally, I don't work with a lot of training aids. Okay. The best training aid that somebody can buy or somebody can use is a full length mirror. Okay. Because if you teach your body to make the correct movements in the swing, too many times people are worried about where the club is in their swing. But if I rotate my, like let's say in the backswing, if I rotate my upper body away correctly and I put my hands are in the right position, based on the correct grip, the club head's going to be in the right position. So I don't have to worry about where the club is. I'll do training without a club, getting people to make the correct body movements in their swing. So when they get a club in their hand, it feels more normal. So if we're working, especially now through the winter with people that are making swing changes, Mm -hmm. the best training you have is a full length mirror. You stand in front of it, you make your backswing, you check to make sure you're in the correct positions. My knees aren't, you know, they're not too bent. My arms aren't too upright. I'm not swinging too flat or too around me. You know, those are the changes that you can make that you can ingrain as a muscle memory with your body so that when you put a club in your hand, it feels more normal. My girlfriend makes fun of me literally every single day because I'll just like practice swing with no club in my hand in the middle of the living room. She's like, what are you doing? This can't help you. I'm like, it is though, because I could, I got to feel that I'm squatting, you know? Right. (laughs) <laughs> now You're put not a couple, at that point yet. You will eventually. Put a couple You're mirrors up there, and yeah. you know now you can start watching your swing. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I mean, to be fair, when I first got my my first ever set of clubs and bag, I pulled it out, and I was like, "All right, I'm going to start golfing." And then I just went up and smacked the ceiling in my living room, <laughs> and I'm like, "Putting them away. <laughs> like I, they're all here. Everything's fine." <laughs> I keep going back, and I tell people the story. When I was younger, my brother and I, we couldn't make it to the driving range one day. So my parents, we grew up in Tonawanda. We had a smaller backyard, but we decided, you know what? We're not going to hit wiffle balls in the backyard today. We're going to hit real golf balls. Well, the way the backyard was set up was it probably wasn't the smartest thing to do because maybe the slightest pull means that the golf ball is going through the living or the family room window where the couch that dad was laying on was right below that window. So me and my brother, we hit a couple balls. Yeah, this is great. Next thing you know, Pull one right through the window, shatters the window. Uh, Dad's covered in glass. Yeah, that wasn't a good day. Then that last time I hit a ball in the backyard too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see those videos on YouTube or on Instagram all the time of people having those rocket nets and they're hitting inside their house. Yeah. I do not have the confidence or the swing path to do that accurately. I would put holes through everything. Yeah. I put a hole through my garage <laughs> that we record the <laughs> our podcast. In. <laughs> That's true. I mean, there's also major league pitchers uh, yeah. that threw through his own uh, window in his house because he missed the net. Right. And he's a pro baseball yeah. pitcher, but whatever. I mean, it happens. Humans are garbage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. People make mistakes. You know, yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. You- so definitely go get a lesson. Yes. That's probably one of your best things is so you can understand how your body would function and how your body should hit the golf ball. Right. And then from there, just the, through the Coach Now app, just keep getting constant feedback. Yeah. Right. It's the best thing to do. I mean, yeah. people go out there and, you know, a set of irons these days, you know, you can buy a good set of irons for 1500 bucks. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a lot of money to spend. But if you spend five or 600 on irons, put the rest in the lessons mm-hmm. or even learning how to play the game. Your golf game, you're going to enjoy the game of golf so much more right. because you're playing better. You're swinging easier. It's, it's At the end of the round, you're not going to feel like you worked so hard. You're not going to be tired and exhausted because we're going to teach you how to use your body yeah, correctly. What's that like? What's that like, not being exhausted? 
well, we haven't worked together yet, so we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> so, okay, last question. What's the most important club in the bag? Pitching wedge. <laughs> what, what club are you going to use the most? Yeah, I mean, pe- people ask me that all the time, and they say, the driver. Well, you only use a driver usually 14 times. Mm-hmm. Putter, if you two-putt every hole, you're going to use a putter 36 <laughs> times or less, but your driver, you're only using 14. Or more, or 36 m- times or, or more. Yeah, or less. Say, who do Could putts? Be. Good for them. <laughs> Good for them. Yeah, I, I joke because I literally use a driver if need be and then a seven iron, a pitching wedge, and a putter. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what it. you're comfortable with. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I mean, that's all I need, anyways. I just, even if it's 180, it's seven iron. If it's 90, it's seven iron. Like, there's no, it's just a terrible range. <laughs> but, and, and that's, we talked about this on our last episode. I started going to Fox Valley for the first time, mm-hmm. uh, like a month ago. And I love that course because you can't pull the driver out in every hole. You Correct. just can't do it because of the way that the fairways are made. You're going to go right into the woods if you do. Yes. So, I, I just, my favorite club is my 56 degree, but I don't use that on every hole. Yeah. You're no, just the seven iron. For sure. It's just funny because eventually we're all going to be on the course yeah. and everyone's going to be laughing at me, but we're going to have fun. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. And that's all part of course management because there are still people that will go out there and pull driver on every single hole mm-hmm. because they'll look at it. Yep. I can cut it around that corner. I can take it over that tree. Well, how many times have you done that? Yeah, I've never done anything. it, but I try it every time. And that's why your ball ends up in the woods and you shoot 100 and, you know, keep trying it, though. That's fine. We'll play for money next time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or there's people that see 390 and they're like, well, I drive. It's a 390 hole. And they're like, no, it's you have to hit it 120 to then go math to whatever right. at the dog leg. So that that's what he taught me. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I can't just bomb this thing. He's like, no, dude, like you're going to be on the other side of the road. So that's, yeah. there's so much to learn about this game. Well, the other issue too, is you get into a, let's say you hit a good drive on a par five. Okay. You've got 260 in for most people, 260 with a three wood, they're going to pull their club, especially guys. We're going to go for it. We're going to try to get there in too. Cause it's, you know, you want to be aggressive. But I teach people, and one of the things, again, working out with a lot of the college players, it's a par five. If you hit it on the green, that's great. More than likely, you're going to miss the green and give yourself a tough shot. So you're still maybe putting for birdie trying to save par. Take that 260 and divide it in half. Hit 130 and then 130. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to be on the green putting for birdie more than if you pull three wood, put it in the water, put it in the trees, you might even top the shot, flub it, who knows? Mm-hmm. But it's not, again, that's about the course manager. It's not always pulling out the longest club and going for it. Yeah. It's a lot about position. And the biggest thing, too, that I learned in the last couple of years is you have to have a shot that you're comfortable with. Like for me, my 56, if I get a 90 yard, 56 degree shot, I'm perfect for that. So in that situation where you're 260 out, you don't want to try to go for it because if I land up and I'm only 60, I'm going to miss the shot because I'm terrible at that 60 yard shot. Right. So you got to play to what you're good at. And then you would take a six iron to get to that 90 yard mark with the 56 degree to give yourself the best chance to get onto the green. That's it sounds like it's you're so on the way to being a golf coach here. You got the whole Thank course you, management thing it. down. Thank yeah, you. but he never practices what he preaches. <laughs> so he just goes up and he's like, nah, nah, it's fine. But it's awesome. Well, you're his first student, right? Yeah. I'm, oh, yeah. yeah, he's my caddy. So he literally walks, he's like, dude, you're right, 130. I'm not out. putting him on the resume. <laughs> well, yeah, obviously. But he's, he's like, you're 130 out. Just use your pitching wedge because that's literally the only other club you would use here. So his job's easy because I limit him to like five clubs. Yeah, that's but, true. Yeah, when you're like carrying a driver or seven iron pitching wedge, <laughs> yeah. it's easy. I have other clubs. Clubs are just like, yeah. He just doesn't know how to hit them right. Which we'll, we'll get there. We'll yeah, get there. The, I'm getting way more comfortable with the six, but that's because I'm super comfortable with the seven. Right. Yeah. So we'll they're there. virtually the same. They are. Yeah. And here's the thing. In my world, they're virtually the same. <laughs> right. Yeah. The swing is basically the same with all the clubs in the back. Mm-hmm. I mean, your six iron is a little longer. The loft is a little different, so it should go a little farther. But you should be swinging the club basically the same you swing any other club. That's an interesting point. Yeah, that just blew so my mind. What is your thoughts on the, those Cobra one length irons that Bryson do, used to use? They're, they're different. I do not like the concept. No, of them. I, it's again, it works <laughs> for him. You've got to have that right mentality to be able to think that way. I mean, the guy has physics formulas stamped in the back of his wedges. <laughs> right? yeah. So, what? Yeah. If you actually saw Bryson DeChambeau's wedges, he has like physics formulas like stamped into the back of them. For whatever reason. He's ridiculously smart. Yeah, dude's crazy. 
what's a, what's his like thought process for doing that? His whole idea is he swings on what they call one uh, the single plane swing. So it's more of Ben Hogan's philosophy of you know single plane back and through. You don't do anything different with the club. You know you don't put your wrists in any different positions. But it's just you stay on a single plane back and a single plane through. So based on that, his philosophy is because all my clubs are basically going to be the same length. I don't alter my swing. The ball is going to go farther because of the loft of the club. So instead of having to get closer to a ball for like a sand wedge or a pitching wedge because the shaft is shorter, he doesn't do that. He just stands the same distance away from the ball every single shot, makes the swing, and now he's hitting his driver like 340 or 350 or something. It's crazy. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Like he carries 350 or it, yeah. it'll roll? It'll roll a little bit, but his carry, I think, last time I saw was like 320. Yeah. So he's carrying 320, 325. If I they mean, were concerned in taking bets that he was going to drive the first hole at the Masters, which is 400 yards. <laughs> Not kidding. He can bomb it like 380. It's disgusting how he's, he's changing the game. He's he's that uh, that thicker white dude, right? Yeah. Yeah. That has okay. the uh, golf caddy hat. Yeah. Yes, yeah, he's yeah. got that okay. old-style yeah. cap. Yeah. 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 Okay. I watched a bunch of his drives on YouTube. I was deep into the, with the rabbit hole, and then it, it was just like his longest drives. It was a compilation of like 15 of the longest, and his one hit the cart path and just rolled all the way down for like 500 yards. Well, that's yeah. <laughs> well, that but one, his swing but, seems so rigid to me. It doesn't seem natural. It, it is a little bit stiffer, but again, that's There's so because much power, though. Yeah. he's got less moving parts in the swing. So it's more about just setting up and basically a position that'd be similar to what your perfect impact position is and doing nothing more than turning back and turning through. The concept seems simple. Yes, it does feel a little more rigid. Your hands are in a little more awkward position to set up. But I mean, I've tried swinging that way. And it's amazing when you do that, your backswing feels a little bit more restricted, Mm -hmm. but you do hit the ball straight. I mean, the concept is there. It just feels really weird. I could literally talk for hours about the intricacies of the golf swing because I'm so fascinated. Like another thing, and I promise we'll stop after this, but (laughs) Tony Finau's swing is so short, but he can still bomb at 320. Correct. I watch golf every single week. I'm such a nerd when it comes to this stuff. I can tell you every person's swing, (laughs) but I, it's just, there's so many intricacies of the golf swing. That's why I cannot emphasize enough just to go get a lesson right? because the person who is going to be teaching you knows so much more about golf than you ever will. And (laughs) yeah, and they will tell you what swing you should be doing to maximize your performance. Correct. So uh, again, thank you so much for everything. Do you want to, anything else that you want to add? No, I just appreciate you guys having me out here and being able to do this interview and, you know, get my name out there a little bit more, talk about the college programs and, you know, really college golf and, the Western York area is is big. There's we have a lot of good players here. Again, Canisius, the men's team has a good program. Niagara women were the only Division One women's college team in the area. You know, Madai's got the program out there. So kids that are looking to stay local and play some college golf, you know, keep look keep looking at some of the local schools because we're gonna be up and coming. Awesome. Well thank you so much for your time, man. We really appreciate it. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it.